Right. Um, let's finish uh, this first part, which is about uh, the, the vessels and uh, the types. We finished with this parcel size distribution, which sort of also defines the typical vessel sizes for the different um, commodity groups. This is another way of looking at it. Here you have the parcel sizes ranged like this, and this is also linked to the cost per ton of freight. So this illustrates also the economies of scale of bigger using bigger vessels. Then you are able to pressure down the, the transport cost per ton, uh, which is illustrated by this figure. And here you have some typical cargoes. Crude oil is transported by very big vessels, um, approaching 300,000 tons. Iron ore and coal are dry bulk cargoes, along with grain and sugar as well, but they are transported in intermediate size vessels. And the higher the value of the commodity, the smaller the typical shipment size is. So you will see chemicals, containerized cargo, cars, machinery and project cargo up here with higher prices and smaller typical shipment sizes. Here it's linked to ship sizes again and uh, the economies of scale. You can see that using a bigger vessel rapidly decreases the price per ton transported. And this is also the reason why we've seen this extreme hub and spoke development in the sector. Um, the fact that it's, uh, uh, there is uh, big economies of scale. In this case, it's bulk carriers. We could draw the same picture for uh, a container vessel, but a lot of the literature suggests that this is getting flatter now and that uh, we will not see any bigger vessels. This is sort of the way the author of this chapter, which is in your curriculum, uh, divides the world seaborne trade. It's about the cargo type, this is the demand side of the uh, figure, and, uh, and then the supply side, the fleet, the vessels uh, are down here. And they meet in what he calls three different big markets for shipping. It's the bulk transport, which is dry bulk and, uh, and liquid bulk, which is then serviced by the tanker market. Then we have the liner operations, uh, which is uh, uh, loose cargo, containers, pallets uh, in the liner business and the big dominating part of this is the container and the row row uh, type of vessels. By the way, the term liner and bulk is not only by commodity type but also by the way they operate. What would be, do you know how a tanker vessel operates compared to a container vessel. What is the big difference in the way they operate? Not technically, but the way they are, the transport are organized. How is this different? Another word which could be used in the way it's organized is called tramp, which means that the typical bulk transports are either organized as single voyages or uh, uh, a, number, a few numbers of single voyages. Whereas the liner transport is according to a schedule. So a container vessel would uh, act according to a schedule and leave a specific port once a week or once a month or something like that. And this is the characteristics of liner transport. Uh, which is very different to the bulk and tramp type of organization. Here is the average size of different vessel categories. And you can see that for most of these, we have an increasing average size of the vessels from the 80s until the 2000s. Um, but there's one exception, and that is the tankers. As I said, the biggest tankers are now out of the market. So actually, with respect to tankers, the average shipment, shipment size has decreased. In all other categories here, the average size 
increases. So to sum up the first part about the world merchant fleet, um, we can notice that maritime transport is much more diversified than the land-based modes. If you talk about land transport, a truck is more or less a truck. They look more or less the same, but vessels are much more uh, individual and uh, there is no such thing as a standard vessel. That's almost true. In some sectors you have fairly standardized ones, but in most sectors they are very different. And the broad categories of the vessels are dry bulk, wet bulk, container, row row, general cargo and specialized. And we have identified a few trends. Um, except for the crude oil vessels, the average ship size increases. And except for wet and dry bulk, the maximum ship size also increases. But it doesn't hold for the wet and dry bulk. They, they have sort of reached their limit probably. Partly this development is driven by economies of scale, as we've seen, and partly the organization of hub and spoke systems. Now, now we switch to the trade patterns uh, and the seaborne tra uh, transport routes. So from focusing on the supply side and the vessels, we now switch to the demand side, which is the, the trade, the commodity um, uh, um, that is traded. And we start by identifying the major shipping routes, which is illustrated by um, this map. Um, we can see that the, the thicker, thicker lines, they are focused on actually three different trades. One is the transatlantic, another one is the transpacific, which is from Asia to North America or similar. And then the third thick line is from Asia to Europe. These are the biggest uh, trade links. Then you see a number of other important links, which we'll focus on when we look at the different commodity groups. Um, here it's ranked by tonnage. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, there are some heavier links here, which constitutes a lot of uh, the tonnage transported. Uh, but we'll be more specific when we look into the different commodity groups here as well. Before we do that, um, the typical sailing times, this has got a lot of detail, but let's focus only on the sailing time here. So a typical transatlantic voyage would be Rotterdam to New York. And with a bulk ship, which are, are uh, slow steaming to some extent at 13 to 14 knots, this would take around 10 days. With a faster container vessel, it would take six days, but now the new triple E class is not designed for 23 knots. It's designed for, I think, some 16 knots. So it will be um, in between here somewhere. Um, if you look at the more uh, longer, this is a trans-Pacific type of link from the US uh, west coast to China. And that would typically, with the bulkier, take 16 days, uh, with a faster container vessel, some 10 days. And then if we, um, well, there is no example of the, the Asia-Europe uh, operation in this example. Okay, if we look at it by commodity type then, first major crude oil exporting regions. We all know that uh, the Middle East is the major exporting region. Then you can sum up all these uh, million tons of export. And biggest among the Middle East exporters is Saudi Arabia. Then you have uh, some slightly less important exporters. You have, of course, uh, countries like Russia and Mexico, which is also on this map, but they are not so important when you talk about maritime transport, because it's mainly exported through pipelines. Russian oil through pipelines to, to Europe and, and Asia, and, uh, and similarly from Mexico to the US. 
But the other regions like uh, North Africa, the North Sea, West Africa, Indonesia, Venezuela are quite important as oil exporters uh, traded by sea as well. Iron ore is another major commodity uh, transported by sea. And here Australia is a very important exporting region. To some extent India, South uh, Africa, but then definitely South Americas with uh, Brazil as the major exporter. And Canada uh, is also important on this map. Switching to coal, uh, it's kind of similar to the iron ore picture. But in this export, China is also an exporter of coal, but they're also uh, a big importer uh, of coal. And that has to do with different qualities of, uh, of coal that they need. But North America is also a major coal exporter. Um, some 50% of the US power production is still coal fired. So this is uh, very much also an issue when it comes to CO2 emissions from power production. So a very brief world trade pattern introduction this was. Um, there are three major trade links for seaborne container transport. That's the Trans-Pacific, the Transatlantic, and the Asia-Europe link. And the latter one is mainly through the Suez Canal. Then we have three major sourcing areas for bulk transport, um, or three major categories. The, uh, the raw oil or crude oil, Middle East, North and West Africa, North Sea, Venezuela, and then Russia and Mexico are also exporting nations, but not so much for, for maritime transport. Iron ore, Australia, South America, and Canada, and coal is a longer list uh, of exporters. Now, so that was the, 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 the broad lines in, in the trade patterns. Um, then we'll switch to some uh, figures of recent market developments, which have been given from, from um, Jarla Hammer, which uh, used to be with Fernley Research in Oslo, uh, and is now a private consultant. And he has allowed us to use his, some of his figures. You've seen similar things like this uh, in the first lecture, but this is the world seaborne trade uh, from 2011 figures. And you can see that the oil products and the crude oil bit is more than a quarter of the trade. And this is then along with the gas, the, the uh, wet bulk market. And then the dry bulk market is coal, iron ore, more or less equal market shares and grain, and then you have something called minor bulks, which are um, a lot of different commodities, uh, uh, rock materials, intermediate industrial products, and, and so on. Altogether, the dry bulk market, uh, slightly bigger than the wet bulk in the, this figure. And you can see that the container market is not so big here, but if you calculate it by value, it would be um, much, much bigger and more important. These are some trends when it comes to oil uh, transport uh, from different regions. This is oil consumption, so it would be mainly determining the import uh, of oil, um, but you also need to con consider the, the production. The basic picture here is very easy to see. You can see that uh, um, Europe and North America has more or less had a stable oil consumption over the last years, whereas it's uh, China in particular, but also other Asian countries, which has the big increase, along with rest of the world, which is the definition of this one. Uh, the former Soviet Union is illustrated here, and which has had a drop in its oil uh, consumption. Now, this should be contrasted with the uh, 
um, oil production figures. And you can see the Middle East uh, here, which is illustrated by this uh, figure, and uh, which is just gain in importance as an oil producer. The North Sea, which Norway belongs to, is on the decline, had its peak oil production uh, a few years ago. Um, both the British and the Norwegian sector of the North Sea oil production is now uh, on the decline. Former Soviet Union is, uh, is uh, still increasing. Now, this is the history of um, uh, the seaborne oil trade. And it goes back to the 60s. We had a huge drop in uh, oil transports uh, here in uh, the mid-70s. We had two oil crises called OPEC-1 and OPEC-2 uh, in 73 and 79. Um, a lot of things happened then. Uh, we have in the 60s and the 70s, there was a huge increase in the demand for oil. So ship owners uh, saw this as a very lucrative business, invested a lot in uh, new tanker capacity. But then something happened in the 70s. Well, actually, three different factors are identified here. One is North Sea oil, which entered the market. And the, this was very close to the consumption area of Europe. So the European countries used to import most of their oil from distant sources, like uh, the Middle East. But then when they started producing North Sea oil, in Britain and Norway in particular, um, this was uh, a catastrophe for the ship owners because uh, they lost a lot of their business. In addition to that, you have a war between Iraq and Iran, which also interrupted some of the supplies from uh, the OPEC region. And uh, the OPEC, OPEC also restricted uh, oil exports. So you had a huge oil price shock, which meant that the demand fall, uh, fell very sharply. And this resulted in a big crisis for the ship owners. And as noted here, uh, banks and financial institutions had to go in and buy the tonnage from uh, bankrupt ship owners. Then we had a steady growth uh, of the market. Uh, the black bit is the dirty market of the crude oil. This is the uh, products market, the refined products. Now, um, if you look at uh, the oil imports, uh, then by region, you will see that Asia is the big importing region for oil but also Europe and North America is quite significant. If we split the Asian figures, you can see that China is bigger than Japan, but India, Korea are also other important oil importers. If you look at exporting regions, uh, we will see that the Middle East altogether is definitely the most uh, important exporting region. Africa has uh, become quite uh, important, former Soviet Union, Latin America, and the North Sea is, uh, is also on the list. But if you split the Middle East thing, it's uh, Saudi Arabia, which is the, the biggest one. Okay. Um, one interesting recent factor is what has happened in the, in the US when it comes to oil production and consumption. You can see that um, a few years ago, uh, the steady trend in the US oil production was downwards uh, facing. And there, um, they relied more and more about, uh, on imported uh, crude oil, which is the red part of the figure. But then they increased their own production through new production technologies, in uh, particular what is called shale oil and fracking, uh, which is a rather controversial way of, of uh, producing oil from uh, um, oil, um, oily rock structures. But that has meant that this long-term trend of declining oil production in the US 
has now been switched to a very sharp increase. Um, and uh, this also seriously affects the, the international shipping markets. So a few trends then of the tanker market. Um, we can see stages of development as important here. In particular, the growth of the Asian economies is, has been important for, for this, the development of the market. Um, in the longer run, environmental concerns may influence the market in, in many different ways. Uh, um, one tries to uh, reduce the dependency of oil in, the, in some parts of the world and that could influence the, the demand for oil in the long run. The energy mix of regions is important. Um, we have recently seen, for instance, that following the nuclear meltdown in Japan, Japan has now mainly, uh, to a large extent, shut down its nuclear uh, power production which means that it has had to, to uh, increase its imports of other material, in particular gas. Um, the depletion of local resources uh, is also a factor. The fact that the North Sea oil, for instance, uh, uh, is on the decline means that Europe will have to import oil from other parts of the world to a larger extent. But then you have things happening like the US shale oil and gas uh, production, uh, which is a result of new production technologies. And then new trade routes could also influence this. Uh, the northern sea routes across the um, Arctic uh, could uh, also uh, significantly alter the market along with new pipelines. Uh, to some extent, um, uh, renewables could also be a factor here. Um, this is a picture of some uh, offshore windmills, and in particular, the UK and uh, uh, Germany has uh, um, been active in this market. This has also been seen as a new development uh, pos potential for the shipping business, uh, partly like this, uh, transport vessels, which are specifically designed for, for uh, transporting windmill section, sections or uh, more service and installation type of uh, vessels and platforms. Okay, these are then the more recent developments in uh, the um, uh, tanker market. Uh, we will not look at all details uh, of this figure but uh, just focus on the credit crunch or the financial crisis, which hit in uh, the summer of 2008. And you can see in this case, it's uh, the uh, average um, cost of uh, hiring uh, a tanker, which is on uh, the vertical axis here. Uh, so the price of oil transport dropped very dramatically uh, in uh, the fall or the autumn of 2008. Um, and this has become a huge challenge, of course, for the tanker owners. Um, the yellow figure here is for the container vessels, and you can see that compared to the tanker vessels, the drop was, has been less dramatic. And there has also been some recovery, but now it's, it's back on a fairly low uh, rate for the container vessel. The dry bulk market has even had a more dramatic um, uh, drop from the financial cri crisis than, than in um, the bulk, uh, wet bulk market. You can see a very dramatic drop in the rates in this, in just a, a month or two. Uh, the rates dropped uh, almost to a, a zero level uh, in the dry bulk market. And this is, uh, been very dramatic for, for the dry bulkers and now it's almost back uh, at the bottom value so the, the market has not recovered yet from this shock. General cargo vessels um, mainly 
most of the, the ship types have, have not had a very big increase apart from the container vessels. This is a very good illustration of uh, the sort of the generational uh, switch and the, the age of containerization. You can see the general cargo vessels, which uh, took care of much of the business before the container vessels, is on the decline here, the blue line. But then there's been a very sharp increase in the capacity uh, of container vessels of the world. Another worrying fact by this figure is that uh, up here in the early 80s, there was still some cargo transported by the general cargo vessels, which could then be put into containers and feed into the container market. But now they have become such a small part of the world market that there is not much left to be containerized. So that is one of the major concerns for, from a container operator point of view that uh, the containerization may, need, may meet some sort of a saturation level. Um, again, this is uh, what happened uh, in the, the financial crisis uh, uh, and, the, and the drop in the container markets. But in the container markets, you have had um, many peaks and troughs of the development. So it's not um, as dramatic as it is for the bulkers. What happened afterwards is what we call slow steaming. When uh, the markets are not so good, a lot of the operators are reducing the speed of the vessels. Uh, that has m at least two different effects. It uh, conserves fuel, so it's a cost minimizing strategy, but it also reduces the overall capacity of the fleet. So it's a way of meeting a falling demand uh, situation. But still, there's been a lot of layup, ships that are taken out of service and, uh, and which are not used. Yeah, I think we've seen enough about that. Now, switching to the ownership of the vessels. Um, or actually, this is the flag of the vessels, where it's registered. And here you can see that most of the vessels of the world is registered in Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, Hong Kong. Now, what is the characteristics of these nations here? Um, is this a bit surprising? What, what kind of nations are these? Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands? What kind of nations is this? Would you expect these to be big ship-owning nations? Exactly. And this is an illustration of what we, uh, a trend that we've seen in shipping for many years of flagging out, meaning that uh, Norwegian ship owners, for instance, would register the vessels in a low tax environment. So uh, the, the flags here, you will see Norway quite far down here. Not so many ships are registered in Norway. But if you look at the ship-owning countries, not where they are flagged or registered. You will see a slightly different list of countries. And Greece is on the top here as the biggest ship-owning nation. Now, notice that this is a figure of the number of deadweight tons. So it means that a big tanker or a dry bulk vessel would count very heavy in this. Whereas an offshore service vessel, which Norway has a lot of, doesn't count so much because it's not so big, but it's, it's very valuable. But here you have the big ship-owning nations of, uh, of the world. Norway used to be higher up on this list a few years ago, has dropped uh, two or three places. Uh, but if you calculate by the value, we would be much higher up because the average value of one of these anchor handler vessels is more or less the same as a very large crude carrier, a big super tanker. So if this figure was by value, Norway would probably be somewhere up here. Since we are in Norway, just a couple of slides on the Norwegian uh, situation. You can see the mix of 
vessels just by tonnage and by the number of vessels. So by the number of vessels, the offshore vessels are now outnumbered the others. Um, but then the traditional Norwegian shipping owners used to be focused very much on oil and, and dry bulk and, and are quite big in chemical tankers still. Uh, a lot of the chemical tanker owners are located in the Bergen area. And this is what has happened in the, in the Norwegian case. Um, we used to have the ordinary Norwegian shipping registry, which had a lot of vessels up until um, the 70s and 80s. Then we introduced, because of this flagging out uh, tendency, we introduced the Norwegian International Ship Registry. Um, and that uh, sort of uh, was very popular in the 80s and 90s. Where, where it peaked, where we had a very favorable taxing regime called Kommanditselskap in that area. And then uh, uh, it has dropped a little bit. But you can see quite a lot of Norwegian ship owners now are running their own vessels in, under a foreign flag. And this is typical for many Western countries. Switching to the container market, there's a lot of figures on this one, uh, small print as well, so let's just focus on a few facts here. These are the major operators in the container uh, business in the world. And you can see on the top is Maersk Line, then the Mediterranean Sh Shipping Company, CMR CGM, which is situated in France, and so on. You can see the Chinese uh, Costco is moving uh, up here, um, and German actors and so on. But there are quite a lot of Chinese ones uh, coming up. Um, if you look at um, this column here, the share of the world total TU capacity, you can see sort of that that's one way of calculating the uh, market share of these operators. That the biggest operator has some 12% of the world market. Uh, they are pretty close, the, the two top ones, uh, both in the area of 11 to 12 percent. Um, so the total top 20 carriers would uh, cover some 70 percent of the world market. So it's a fairly high market concentration, fairly few operators dominate the world market, and this might even look worse from a competition point of view in um, half year, a year. Um, the top three operators, they have said that they will start to cooperate next summer if they're allowed to. Something called the P3 alliance. And if you allow these three to cooperate, you can see that the cumulative share they would control some 30% of the world market if they cooperate. So the question is, is this problematic? Is this all right? Could it be a problem? If you were on the European Parliament and you saw this, that uh, these three operators, they they propose a new alliance. They want to cooperate. And you were an EU bureaucrat or a politician. Would you be happy about this? What could be the problem? That they'll get to a big market share and that they control the market themselves almost. That's so why the competitors can't compete with them. Mm -hmm. And why is that a problem? And market power usually means? They can the other ones. Yeah, and they could increase prices. increase prices. Yeah. Or they could control from, it could also be a strategic problem um, from some country's point of view if, you, if they come to rely upon a few commercial actors. And already over the last few years, the American antitrust competition authorities uh, have started investigations trying to follow whether these biggest actors are actually cooperating uh, 
uh, with um, agreed prices or sharing the market between them or something like that. So they already, the US especially, but also the EU already has follows the container operator market pretty close. And I don't know if they will be allowed to cooperate. My guess is that uh, this is not very popular with American and European uh, authorities. But we'll see. They have said that they will launch this cooperation next summer. So we'll see what happens. OK. Um, what happens when, when you have a big uh, crisis like this, the, the significant drop? One, one of the problems from an operator point of view is that uh, they didn't anticipate this. When the, the market is peaking like this, they are making millions of dollars and everything looks great. So what happens then? Well, they use these dollars to order new tonnage. They go to the shipyard, they, they see that this is a booming business. We need more ships to earn even more money. Then all of the operators go to the shipyards. There is a limited building capacity in the world for new vessels, which means that when you have a boom time like this, the order books, the lead time between order and delivery of vessels could be as long as four years, at least more than three years. And that's a big problem, of course, when the market suddenly drops. Not only are they suffering from uh, a poor profitability of their existing vessels, but they have ordered new vessels which will come into the market in one year, two years, three years. And in a situation like this, when the freight rates are low, it's a disaster to have new vessels entering the market all the time. And in the container market, this is the bulk, but in the container market, the order book here was in the area of 40% of the existing fleet, meaning that you almost added 40% of the capacity in the years after the drop. And that made the crisis even deeper. Some of the operators would then try to renegotiate the contracts. They go to the shipyards and say that uh, this is a crisis, there's no way we can survive with this. Could we either cancel our um, uh, contract, then they will have to pay some sort of a compensation for that. Or they can renegotiate re and say that instead of having it delivered in 2012, could we have it in 2013 um, if we uh, pay a small sum. So this has been happening a lot. It's what's called slippage. Okay. This is the container fleet uh, situation uh, early this year. Uh, you can see that uh, of the biggest vessel, these are different sizes of container vessels. And the major problem is in the biggest, uh, in the market for, for the biggest uh, ships. You can see that the order book is more than 50% of the existing fleet. So in the next few years, we will have deliveries of quite a lot of the biggest vessels. And the question is if there is a market uh, for this and uh, whether this capacity really is needed. OK, time for another break. And we'll finish the market trends before we move on. <laughs>